back into what we've been talking about, right? We've looked at the history of successful security breaches, successful hacks. We've seen what happened to those people, right? Almost all of them ended up in jail. And so we're talking about basically, on one hand, it's how to not end up in jail uh, related to security stuff, right? Uh, other stuff I can't really help you with. Um, let me see a, there we go. And then we, um, and the flip side of that, right, so not going to jail is one thing, right, but I don't know, more importantly, or the other thing we need to think of is are we being ethical security researchers and security practitioners, right? So the ethical component is also very important here. So uh, we talked about don't doing anything illegal to avoid jail. Um, so in hacking and in the security context, it means Never do not hack into a system that you don't own or that you do not have explicit permission to hack into. All right, so what does explicit permission mean? What? What's it? Authority. Authority? Yeah. In what sense? <laughs> so how do I know that you have explicit authority to hack into a system? until they get that piece of paper that authorizes them to do so, right? Because otherwise they don't have any cover, they're just breaking into a system. Uh, but if the company hires you to break into that system, really until you have a piece of paper, uh, you don't want to do it. What else? My only advice would be get a lawyer and figure out what you're going to do because I'm above my pay grade, if you will. Um, that could be a, yeah, okay. Let's rephrase that then. If the government comes to you to test their own system, right, you want to make sure you have a piece of paper that says that that's legal, right? But you also want to make sure that they actually own those systems too, right? So if I come up to you and say, hey, I work for Bank of America. I want you to pen test our systems. Here's $500, and here's a piece of paper that means nothing because it comes from me and not from Bank of America, right? You want to make sure that you're you know, talking to the right people, that you've done your due diligence. Uh, what else? What else would be some examples of somebody giving you permission? Yeah. From another country that doesn't have jurisdiction on our extradition. Uh, that may be, as far as the avoiding jail part, as far as the ethical part, no. I would say it's still. If you're in another country that doesn't have an extradition treaty with the US, that's still unethical to hack somebody's system without permission. So permission, what are the forms of permission, right? We're talking about paper, yeah. Uh, bug bounty programs. Yeah, bug bounty program, right? So a company may actually have a policy on their website that says, we'll talk about that in a second, right? But they may explicitly say, hey, we allow you to attempt to find vulnerabilities in our system provided that you follow these rules. Uh, what else? Software. The code is out there. Yeah, the code is out there. You, not only is the code out there, right, but you can download it, run a version on your own system, and now you fully control that so you can find all the bugs, everything you want to, to your heart's content on your own system, right? But if you were to then do that and then go out and try to look for vulnerable installations to test, is that ethical? No, because you don't have permissions to break into other people's systems, right? You only have permission to break into other systems. Uh, the other thing I'll say is verbal, I mean, in some cases, verbal permission is acceptable, right? So, uh, as we'll see, so I will be using a homework submission system. This is a security course. Uh, you know, we'll talk about when I assign the homework on Monday, but as long as it's not, if you're not overtly malicious and trying to DDoS the server while people are trying to submit homeworks, right? That's really annoying. Uh, but if you do find a security vulnerability there, then you should tell me. Right? And I give you permission to attempt to find it on my systems, but you know you have to you have to be responsible and make sure you're only testing my system and not all of my lab machines where we're doing research and posting important data, right? So that it's only targeted to this one machine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why do you need a written document as such to uh, hack into someone's system? Like there are private companies who find uh, reportedly uh, reported uh, malware in Android OS. Mm -hmm. So 
they were not uh, assigned uh, the task to find vulnerabilities. They just found it. Ah, so what's mal what's malware though? So what they did is uh, they sent a malware to the MMS. As soon as uh, you download it, the video player uh, had a bug mm -hmm. which used to execute it. Right. So the video player crashed and it was a proper overload. But how did they test that? Did they test that on your phone? No. Did they test that on my phone? Did they test that on government agents' phones? Phones? No, they tested it on their own phones, right? Their own devices that they control. Right, so that's the key point is that yeah, hmm. on devices that you own and you control, you can do, in my mind, whatever you want, right? If you have the authorization to find vulnerabilities, that kind of stuff, right? You don't need, in my mind, you don't need permission from Google to try and find vulnerabilities on an Android device that you own. But if you're gonna try to exploit my device, you better have my permission in a written document. Uh, otherwise, if it's not written, then you can say you had permission, I say you didn't, and now we have a problem. So yeah, we'll actually get into kind of what to do, that's also part of ethics, what to do after you find a vulnerability. Okay, so we all wanna practice, right? That's why we're here, yeah? I was actually gonna say, aren't there certain stipulations? Um, for example, if the system is quote unquote closed source, uh, like iPhone, there was a huge thing when iPhone first came out about them hating security researchers because iPhone, or Apple technically owned the iPhone operating system and everything else associated with it, so doing the research on that led to a lot of legal battles. So here's where we get into more of the legal part. That is definitely not my forte. So I will once again state that I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice. Um, in my layperson's opinion, if I am bought your software and it's running on my phone, I can do whatever I want to it, including try to reverse engineer and look at the binary to see how it works. And that's basically what the root of hacking is. You're trying to understand how something works, and then you notice that it does something it's not supposed to, and you prove that uh, on your own device. And when you rent, uh, I mean, when you get an iPhone or any Apple device, EA exclusively say that it's not yours. It's a rental, unlimited rental. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, a, I'm not an end user license agreement lawyer either. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have to be careful, but. I'm the lawyer in the room. Yeah. At least I'm afraid of that. It's been a few years though. Sure. Uh, so some of the difference is the software is going to be licensed typically, so mm -hmm. they have different controls that they can put on that. Forcing that, so you have two different aspects of legal, right? You have business, you broke a contract, it's illegal, it's not really illegal, it's illegal, you're going to jail. So you can break the terms of use, and as long as nobody knew, you're not probably breaking any law, other than the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, anti-circumvention stuff. Yeah. If you're doing it yourself and you don't tell anybody, there's it's really hard to say that they're ever right. gonna know. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a good point. It's not, and you're not doing anything that's causing other people harm, technically. So, there's no real way for them, I mean, there's no damages or anything there for really them to go and, and get you with, other than to annoy you with a lawsuit if Right, so yeah, that's a great point. So the EULA is, if I understand it correctly, is a, essentially a contract between you and that company that's giving you the software, right, you and Apple. So by not following that contract, you're just breaking your agreement with Apple, but that's not necessarily illegal, right? They could sue you for breach of contract or something like that, but then, I don't know, they got probably a PR nightmare because hmm. people don't do that. And then even, I think, uh, the other point is, are the, every clause in the end user license agreement that you sign, is it actually enforceable by the company or by them suing you, right? Like they could, uh, I don't know, lots of, lots of various parts here. Um, from my mind, without the legal aspect, just the ethical aspect, it's totally, because, well, like I said, I'm not hurting anybody, if, and I'm not using this to gain unauthorized access, I'm using it for my own knowledge, uh, to understand the system more, to understand how it works, uh, to develop you know, my understanding of the system and to teach people maybe about how the system works. But to me, that's totally fine. But so I'd make a yeah. distinction, but I'd agree sure. with you. So, please, please. Uh, breaking the law, what you're worried about is getting caught, essentially. Yes. Whether you get caught or not has no bearing on ethics, right? So True. ethics is about you being a better person and about right. you being a good person for society and for engineers, and so that's what we're worried about. You say don't go to jail, but really what we're talking about is Correct. 
what constraints do you control your actions with your, your yeah. own actions? Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yes. I couch it in here because this is a little bit more <laughs> immediately recognizable, right? Yeah, and it's, and it's fun, exactly. But, um, but yeah, even if, you know, even if there was no laws against breaking into computers, even if we lived in a country with no extradition treaty, right? Like, you still want to do this because you want to be a good person, you want to be a good engineer, you want to be a good security professional. And all of you are representing me when you go out there and do the security stuff, right? So they'll be like, who taught you how to do this? And they like, teach you about the ethics of what you're doing. And you'll be like, yeah, Adam told me how to do this. And he said it was totally cool. And <laughs> this is a way so I can cover myself. OK. All right, so practicing in an ethical manner, uh, like we said, right? Download that code onto a server or a system that you control. Virtual machines are incredibly cheap. You can run tons of them on your tiny laptop, right? So you can have as many machines as you want. Um, also, the other thing that's happening nowadays is uh, bug bounty programs. So we're going to look at that in a second. So yeah, there's a lot of companies out there that actually give you the license to try to find vulnerabilities in their software on their live websites sometimes, provided that you follow their guidelines and their policies, right? And once again, that's a contract between you and the company. But here they're giving you explicit written permission to do this. What's another way? Are there other ways? And you're all, most of you masters and PhD students, right? You do, become, become an academic. <laughs> right, so not that I can do whatever I want. Right? <laughs> Oftentimes, part of our research is we want to understand how widespread vulnerabilities are. We want to understand, you know, because finding, it's the difference if I found a vulnerability in a Windows XP system that only 1% of the country is running, it's not that interesting, right? I mean, actually 1% is kind of a lot, so let's say it's 0.01% or something very small. Right? That's interesting, but it's not very impactful, right? But if I say that I found a vulnerability that's running on 80, 90% of Linux servers, uh, like the, um, the Shellshock bash vulnerability, right, that was affecting 50, 60% of internet accessible computers, that's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes we actually, when we do vulnerability analysis, we want to, we actually will go and try to find vulnerabilities in systems, uh, but, we have to do this very carefully. So we think about, OK, when we do this, are we going to be uh, crashing any systems? Uh, what's the possibility like of uh, impact to real world systems? For instance, uh, my lab at UC Santa Barbara, they took over the Torpig botnet for six days. So they found out that this botnet, so it would install software on each of your computers, and then it would contact a random seeming DNS name to get command and control instructions. Well, what one of the students found out is he figured out that this wasn't a random domain, and that it was based on certain things that he could predict. So they registered six or seven days worth of domain names. And so when that day came about, they had thousands of, probably hundreds of thousands of computers connecting back to them. Mm -hmm giving them all the information, all the private data that was sent, all everything that it would have sent to its controllers to, to us for research purposes. Then the question becomes, so what do we do, right? So one of the things that could have been done, right, one of the options is, well, we know that command and control infrastructure has the capability to, essentially, we could send an uninstall command, mm -hmm. or send some kind of command to run on the systems to uninstall that. So what are some of the ethical considerations of that? What do you have to weigh? No. Mm, you can run a command on anybody's computer, so you should know that you shouldn't be doing some things uh, like like erasing someone's memory, reading someone's private data. So those are the answers. Yeah, so how do you know that this is going to be successful on every single machine that you run this command on? It doesn't need to be. If you're trying out a malicious com uh, uh, Command, you shouldn't try it out. So, so. Ah, ah, okay, yeah. Definitely, you don't want to do any malicious commands, right? Definitely yeah. first decision. We're, you know, we're trying to think of, so what could we do, right? So we want to try to uninstall it, right? Do we have permission from some machines? Yeah, do we have permission from all of these 100,000 people <coughs> to delete these viruses on their computers? What's the flip side to that, though? A sample set, probably. What? A sample set. A sample set? Trying to get permission from these people? 
be concerned about uh, unknown effects of uninstalling it. Yeah. Do you know every single system that's being run? The example is always, uh, what if there's a heart rate monitor that's running a Windows XP machine that's infected with this virus? That because it has some weird environment, you try to uninstall it and you end up crashing this heart rate monitor or this medical device and then you kill someone. <laughs> right? What's the pros? Yeah. Right. To keep talking. Um, so trespass, so you're basically gonna trespass on their systems to do yeah. it. And you can think about it in like an actual house mm -hmm. or however, but everything has exceptions. Your property rights, all rights, have certain controls that we put around them. You could, from an ethical standpoint, say, well, we're doing the right thing. We're helping everybody in general, just like a police officer that breaks down your door because you're being harmed by somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. And at the, the same time, we can't, well, no, I'm not going to go into that. But, so it's, you have unknown effects. There are unknown minuses. But it seems at the time when you're making the decision that it's the best for the overall, for society as a whole. There's no clear ethics. No, there's definitely no right answer. There's no right or wrong answer, right? That's the whole point. Right. But the important thing is you can't just do whatever you want. Like You have to think through these things and have some justification that, yes, it's going to benefit society. Because this, this is a very malicious piece of software that's actively stealing people's usernames and passwords, their credit cards, their social security numbers, date of birth, everything. And it was sending all of this data to the malicious people who were not using it for good purposes, right? So one argument is, well, hey, <coughs> able to completely eradicate, get rid of this virus. Maybe you could even think of patching their machines, right, to the latest version so this doesn't happen again, right? Um, but then the flip side is, yeah, if it's a house, that'd be like you noticing that your neighbor's window is busted. So you sneak through that window or something and somehow like patch it or fix their window for them. But during the time you were inside their house, <laughs> would you be super stoked to wake up in the morning and see me or my the nerdy researchers from Santa Barbara like inside your house in the middle, you know, in the morning. <laughs> like, no, don't worry, we're just we're here to fix your window. We saw it was broken. We're just here to fix it and then we're gonna leave. So what would you have done? Would you have done it or not done it? What are some other options? Yeah. Change the way you contact the DNS server? Mm -hmm. Change the way it contacts the DNS server? Yeah, I mean so the technical way of how to do it at any point, you have to somehow change something on their system or run code on their system, right? And really, that's the root issue. Like, can you even do that or should you do that? Ethically figure out what's the worst case scenario. Like, as you said, if it is going to kill a person, then probably not take the risk. Uh, but if it's like uh, probably going to get a machine down for a day, but I feel it's for the greater good of the society, I would rather do it. So that's kind of the tricky part, right? And part of the worst case scenario is you don't know, because you don't know all these 100,000 machines. And then you start thinking about some engineering issues, right? Like, can you actually write and ensure that it's not, that this worst case scenario is not gonna happen? Mm -hmm. No, because you can't possibly test on all of these machines, right? It's almost impossible. Um, there's kind of a third option that's related to what somebody over here is talking about. Yeah? Uh, is the, if you can see if there's a way to cut on the source, see if we can attack the source, which is costing the whole... Mm. Uh, yeah, so that's another, yeah, so we could say maybe use this information to go after the larger botnet. Yeah, that's a good good approach. So kind of like sidestep it, don't do this, but use the data that we're collecting to try to find the bad guy. Yeah, so actually that is part of what they did. So they, as soon as this happened, they contacted the FBI, they contacted Bank of America, some other banks, and they set up an agreement where they would actually give them part of this data so that Bank of America could find out you know, their users that were compromised, the credit cards that were compromised. Uh, also, ethically, you can also kind of, in some sense, appeal to a higher authority, right? So you can say like, hey, FBI, we have this ability to do this. Do you think we should or do you think we should not, right? So mm -hmm. you know, it kind of goes back to the appeal to the government, what they think. So in this case, uh, they decided definitely not to do that, um, yeah, because it was, um, it was one of the first times researchers had done this, and so we didn't want to be responsible if anything bad happened, right? The government, the FBI didn't want to be responsible either. Um, we were just using it for research purposes. Uh, some other examples, so there's cases where, I mean, we're doing some research now where we're looking for specific vulnerabilities on the internet, so we crawl um, 
But we do this very carefully and we target specific vulnerabilities that are highly unlikely to have side effects. <coughs> so it's the difference between having somebody execute code on your machine and just kind of looking at the house and noticing that there's a broken window, right? Uh, in my mind, those are good, you know, it, it's costing people bandwidth and resources, so you have to think about it, you know, from an ethical perspective, but at the end of the day, we're learning something new and we're, we're engaging in research, so. Plus, I kind of have the backing of the university, so if anybody does try to sue me, I have, you know, some, <laughs> some resources there. So being an academic, I uh, really thanks for that, just to put a little plug in there. <laughs> Okay, bug bounty programs are awesome. So this is actually something that's fairly new, I'd say the last, I don't know, four or five years. Um, and so they'll give you money sometimes, or fame, uh, in exchange for reporting security vulnerabilities to them. Anybody have an idea of how much money you can get rich? Um, last year, PayPal gave out 600,000 to people. Total. <coughs> Total. Yeah. So for each vulnerability, you get $10,000. Depending on the vulnerability, right? Yeah. Depending upon the yeah, so it could be anywhere from $100, $50, to $1,000, to $10,000. Um, I mean, being perfectly honest, we're a class, you know, for researchers, you can get way more money selling them to bad guys, <laughs> right? Yeah. But for me, ethically, I would never even, I mean, I would think about doing it because I have to think about things, right? But I would never actually do that because <laughs> right. you're causing way more harm, right? Like you, and you're essentially <coughs> actively causing harm as opposed to, in this case, is you're actually trying to help fix systems and maybe you can get something out of it. So even if they just put your name on a Hall of Fame list, to me, that's totally worth it. Um, okay, the big thing here is, remember, it goes back to permission. So you have to understand that they're giving you permission, but what permission they're giving you and what's in scope. Those are the incredibly important things. Uh, and actually, a lot of companies have bug bounty programs. Google, Facebook, AT&T, Coinbase, uh, GitHub, Roku, Microsoft, PayPal, uh, I think, honestly, American Airlines recently also announced a bug bounty program where they'll give you miles for reporting <laughs> bugs. Uh, Trey may not be your thing, depending on how you like American Airlines, but. Uh, so yeah, so there's a list, you can go look up these things, and you can go, but the important thing is reading the terms of service. Uh, because what can happen is, for instance, in Facebook had an incident, uh, what Facebook does, their bug bounty program, uh, they actually give you a completely separate Facebook, in essence. So you can just generate new test accounts. Right. And when you log in, you're in this separate, essentially disconnected from the normal Facebook test environment. So you can test two friends who, uh, two people who aren't friends and see if you can get them to post on each other's wall or send each other messages or whatever. Um, and that's how they test. So they say, hey, you find a vulnerability and you've shown good faith effort to use this test system, um, you know, we'll give you money, we'll pay you for the vulnerabilities that you, that you report. And so it, what happened is a security researcher found a vulnerability on Facebook to post on anybody's wall. So hey, this is a vulnerability. Yeah. Why? The, I mean, it's not supposed to allow anyone to- yeah, It's not supposed to do that, right? Yeah. So why, but why is it a security problem? Yeah, privacy concerns. I mean, it's against the access control policies of the application, right? The application specifically says, like, uh, you know, you have to be a friend to be able to post on somebody's wall. And so he did try to, so he reported this to Facebook through the bug bounty program. Uh, unfortunately, so he was a Turkish researcher. Um, not, it's not unfortunate that he was Turkish. It's unfortunate <laughs> because there was a breakdown in communication between him and the Facebook team, where his English wasn't great, and they weren't really understanding what he was saying, and so he tried again, and they had several back and forth, but the Facebook team were not acknowledging, basically, his report. Yes. Um, and the other thing you have to think about, right, is these team, when you have these, these systems, you get a lot of reports, and a lot of them are crappy, right? Of like, oh, I can write on my own wall, that's a vulnerability. <laughs> No, you can do that. Like, mm -hmm. Or I can send someone a message. Like it happens all the time. Yeah, question? No. Um, so it's understandable that I guess they didn't follow him, but it's kind of unfortunate. So what he decided is he's like, hey, I found this important issue, right? I he was.
driven from, I think, a good place, where he said, hey, you know, this is a bad issue. If I found it, it's highly likely that a bad guy can find it, right? So I really want Facebook to fix this. And so, okay, you're this person, the fake, you're not getting any more with the Facebook team, what do you do? <laughs> Make it public? On the real site? Yeah, so which someone would you choose? <laughs> right? So he decided, well, I'm going to tell Mark Zuckerberg about it by posting on his wall all the details and to get attention about the vulnerability. Um, and get attention on the vulnerability he did, trust me. Like, I think it was fixed within an hour, yeah. right? Um, but then Facebook, once they, they did realize it was a vulnerability, realized it was him, obviously, found the account, started talking to him. But ultimately, they said that the researcher didn't follow their policy, right? Because they actively broke the security of the real system. And therefore, the bounty was ineligible. And so he didn't, he didn't receive a bug bounty. Um, so this is what it looks, it looks like. So this is him writing on the wall. Uh, it says, sorry for breaking your privacy and posting to your wall. I had no other choice. Uh, made after all the reports sent to the Facebook team. And it has more. So yeah, I imagine Mark Zuckerberg is pretty pissed. <laughs> oh, yeah, here's the whole thing. Uh, yeah, so it's about this uh, it's a thing. He tried to report it twice. He didn't get a reply. So oftentimes, you will have to work very closely with uh, these security teams. And oftentimes, it's frustrating. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, like, I'm doing you a service, and you're just blowing me off and not, you know, I know about this really important vulnerability. But at the end of the day, you know, there's humans on the other end. You have to realize that they're trying to do their job. And so you have to be uh, patient, and they should be patient. Um, well, we saw that they fixed it on one hour after more. So they did have the time. <laughs> yeah, so that's it's tricky. I mean, I would never do this. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to keep trying with the security team and keep being like, no, this is really a problem. Because your other option. What are some of your other options at that point? What do you suggest? Yeah, you could let it go. You could never tell anyone. It's an option. <coughs> it waste all your time, right? I mean, and I don't know. To me, that I still, to me, I have an ethical problem with that, or personally, because it's like mm -hmm. I found it. A bad. Somebody's going to like. I'm not that much smarter than everyone else, right? Somebody smarter than me and more malicious than me is going to find it, and I knew about it first. It'd be like if you're a bridge inspector and you saw a huge crack in the bridge and you just like didn't tell anybody about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, personally, if I were there, uh, now that the security team has confirmed that it's not a bug, I would just go and release it on public. So that's the other option, right? We're releasing it, writing a blog post about it, right? <laughs> so what are the implication problems there? People would know about the vulnerability and bad guys can use it. Yeah, so that's one, that's a huge risk there, right? Is people could know about the vulnerability. Um, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, he kind of did the same thing. I mean, I don't know the exact date for permissions on these posts, but I think anybody could probably view Mike Mark Zuckerberg's wall and learn about this. I mean, I saw it on a news site like pretty soon after it happened. It's kind of the same thing, right? But then you're releasing this information publicly to both good guys and bad guys before the problem is actually fixed, right? Yep. So then you got to think about what happens if people learn this from you and then start exploiting it in the wild against people and start posting on your grandma's Facebook page or something like that. Does Facebook security team problem? It's Facebook security team's problem, but you caused it. Uh, no. It was Cammy. Was it? Nobody knew about it. Nobody was talking about it. OK, you have like the open report to Facebook. But there is always this chance that someone else knew about the vulnerability before you actually found it. So, so that set of people were probably already exploiting it, and Facebook didn't even know. So you at least found something also. 
That could oh. be the. That's a little bit difficult yeah, to outside, fine. right? Because you don't have any source code <laughs> to find the board. Yeah, do you want to repeat that point? So Yeah, so so I feel that probably this vulnerability could have been known by other people and who were probably exploiting it. Now since you found it and you made it public, now they're gonna fix it because they now know. So that is one thing. That yeah, so that's the other thing about public disclosure, right? So uh, that's another thing to think about. So that's why maybe sitting on it is not the best can one. often in some cases be worse in some sense, right? If people are actively exploiting it, right, and you just sit on it, they're gonna keep doing that. Right? But the flip side, if you go public, now there's that gap in between when everybody knows about it, when Facebook can fix it, and how people can trivially exploit it again. Well, like this guy, he also did something really stupid. Like he actually put like a link to details about the exploit. He could have just yes, posted yes. and say like, hey, I've got an exploit, I'm posting to you all, contact me, yeah. and have your security. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, he could have done it by raising attention. He probably would have violated the policy, but at least he's not publicly disclosing it. But one of the tricky things about security is once people see that, they know where to look. And so they know how to, I mean, they don't know exactly how to do it, but Someone when you direct them to their, their attention, they'll, they're will they likely to find it. Yeah. So in uh, hacker culture, there's this organization called Zero Day Initiative mm -hmm. that actually kind of addresses these issues mm -hmm. because there's a lot of companies you'll report a vulnerability and it'll cost them more money to fix the vulnerability than to just leave it and get whatever is stolen stolen. Um, and so with Zero Day Initiative, the idea is that, all right, responsibly disclose the vulnerability and then after a certain amount of time, publicly disclose the vulnerability and then the company can do whatever they decide. And in this case, they fixed it in an hour. Exactly, yeah. So that gets into the idea of disclosure, right? How do you report? You find the vulnerability, how do you report it? What are the ethics behind different types of reporting? I actually have some, uh, not issues, but uh, ZDI is not entirely, they have a weird other side. Uh, so, so, what are your options? You find a vulnerability, we've kind of talked about some, but what are your options? Not in Facebook now, just generally. Assuming, but that's actually a tricky thing, right? So assuming they have a security contact, you just called customer support and said, hey, yeah, I found a cross-site scripting vulnerability on your web page on the search page. They'd be like, well, who are you? Are you trying to hack me? What are you talking about? <laughs> right? Because they don't have the technical skills to evaluate what you're saying. Right. If you're getting the same email, like it's not a bug or something, then better to yeah, talk with them. Let's, yeah, so let's go back. So yeah, so we can disclose to the company we can tell everyone, right, which is kind of considered the full disclosure policy. So it's whenever you know, there are mailing lists, uh, bug track, um, a bunch of other ones where people report vulnerabilities that they found. So what are some of the down downsides here? I mean, you leak it out to the malicious people as well. So. Yeah, you're giving it out to malicious people as well, right? Potentially malicious people. Um, what's What's the good thing? It's open knowledge, it should be fixed now. The company knows too, yes, right? So if it is severe, um, yeah, you could potentially, you know, you're getting it fixed, you're getting results, right? You're actually, in some ways you can think you're making people safer, right? Uh, you could tell the company or group responsible for the software, right? And this is, I will say it is kind of a, I guess a misleading or very positive term. They call it responsible disclosure, implying that everything else is un not responsible, but um, so, let's say this scenario happens. Let's say it's, so in this case, Facebook completely ignored this person. Let's say they acknowledge it, right? You report a vulnerability to, let's say, Microsoft in Windows 10. And they say, awesome, thanks so much for telling us. We really appreciate it. We're gonna put you on our website of people who found security vulnerabilities. Um, you know, we're working on a fix, <coughs> right? And then 30 days goes by, you don't hear from them. Another 30 days goes by. Ah, we're still working on the fix. Another 30 days goes by. Three months goes by. Still working on the fix. Six months goes by. Still working on the fix. Do you wait? What do you do? Is it possible that as a user, I can go to the police maybe that uh, because of this bug, the, uh, my privacy is being violated? It's tricky. Mm. Mm. 
I mean, you could I actually have. don't even know how to answer that because on one hand, I don't think the police, if you went to just the local police department, they no, couldn't care at all. But there are government entities no. that will, like CERT, I believe, will help coordinate responsible disclosure. So if you find a really bad vulnerability, I believe you can tell CERT, uh, the CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team that we saw that was created in response to the worm. They will help you contact the relevant companies. Because sometimes it may not be one entity, right? Like if you find a vulnerability in the Linux kernel, how many different organizations do you have to work with? Yeah. Right? So people developing the kernel plus all of the downstream distros that are using that kernel to get them to upgrade to the <coughs> latest version. Um, anybody who's ever made a derivative of the Linux kernel that may have that vulnerability. Um, so even just doing this can be hard, identifying the group responsible. It opens our software, it just might be regular developers who are doing this in their free time. Some sites are great. A bad guy, right? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter where you know. Maybe you know them in person, or maybe you know them just through an IRC chat and yeah. they're a Bitcoin address, or they send you Bitcoins. Um, you know, you could sell that information to somebody who you know is going to you do malicious things with it. Mm -hmm. uh, what about what would be like a gray market kind of a thing? What do I mean by gray here? Competitors. Competitors? Ooh, that's tricky. Yeah. You can sell it to competitors, and they can do whatever they want with that information. It's not your problem. <laughs> what else? Open market, like open space. Uh, they can make use uh, by uh, ethically following uh, that bug and reporting it to the concerned team, or they can use it for a wrong purpose. Yeah, so you could. So what kind of organization? Doing criminal things with it, but something that's you know 
probably close. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you only have civil liability. If they're doing criminal acts, then you would at least be a co-conspirator at you know the at the easiest you know at the the part. And intent gets a little weird there. Mm -hmm. And then if they're doing criminal acts, you have additional criminal liabilities that that go with that. So you could go to jail if they if they do that. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of legal issues. There's, right? It's very complicated. Yeah, it's very very, very complicated. Very complicated. So who is buying these things? Yeah. So there may be a team of people who actually work to fix such problems and then they sell these solutions to these own to mm. these mm. companies. So yep. Ah, actually, and yeah. So <coughs> actually, ZBI <coughs> is what owned by HP, I believe. Is that mm. right? The Deserve Day Initiative. Somebody bought them. Uh, there are a lot of these companies, and what the what some of them will do is they will buy your vulnerability, uh, buy your exploit or your vulnerability, and then they'll create a signature for that, put that in their antivirus engine, push it out to everyone, and then report the vulnerability to the company so that they can tell all their customers, hey, we're protected against zero day vulnerabilities because they buy the knowledge and use it to update their system. Right. I believe that's how ZDI works. But it's tipping point. Tipping point. Tipping point? I think that's how they, I don't know if it's ZDI specifically, but there are other like organizations like that. Some of them are owned by um, by antivirus companies, and that's what they use that information for to improve their product. What about, anybody heard of the hacking team breach? Data breach? No? The hacking team was an, is, is or was, I don't know if they actually went under. They're an Italian company. Uh, they provide offensive security solutions, they say. So part of what they provide is uh, surveillance systems they sell to governments. Um, but you have to get a surveillance system on somebody's device, right? So they will buy, they bought vulnerabilities from people and sat on them and used them in their product and sold them to governments, local governments, national governments, uh, to use, to get onto people's phones and laptops and to install their remote uh, viewing software. Um, so yeah, to me, that's much more in the gray, dipping into the black side of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You probably submitted to a bounty hunter program, and then in time to tell it to someone you know it might be. <laughs> what so does it mean? Double, so what double happened if, what happened if you did that? Well, the company wouldn't know that probably they found them, you know, as well, while they just being picked. Yeah, so what's, how do black markets work? driving force. You have a bunch of criminals, right? You're all right. criminals, you know you're all thieves. Yeah. How do you how does anybody do business with each other? Trust. 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 Yes. Reputation, right? Exactly. If you're known as a person who you're actually I, I believe some of the hacking team stuff, they would pay up front and then they would pay after a year or whatever if nobody if that vulnerability was still working, was not disclosed, they would pay you an additional bonus. Yeah, because it's just information, right? There's nothing you can duplicate it, you can share it. If somebody else happened to find it, you'd just be screwed without that money. Uh, but, it's, but yeah, but and if you had a reputation for, hmm, somehow all of these vulnerabilities that this person is selling us happen to be go bad in five days, I'm not going to do business with you anymore, right? Uh, oh, and nobody mentioned this. What about governments? Yeah. <coughs> Sell to the U.S. government. I'm I don't know how to do it, but I'm sure somebody, I'm sure there's some way you could do that. NSA, part of their job is to find and catalog these exploits, which we found out from the Snowden leaks. Uh, what about other governments? You sell to, yeah? Uh, what I was going to say is it happen on this side, or what they exactly put something in the back and then it can be accessed? Deep web. Nah, to me it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, it's, uh, unless you're trying to teach me how to. Yeah, I mean, it all happens through Tor and the Bitcoins yeah. and all that stuff, right? Because you're trying to get anonymity, but to me, that stuff's not really important, right? That's just the communication medium. Yeah. What's important is who's behind it and what are people doing, right? So, like, I don't know, what do you think? Could, could you sell it to, a, well, I say foreign government, but let's say foreign to all of us, right? Like, what if, well, I don't know, um, like, I don't know, Venezuela, or you think of maybe, like, North Korea, the North Korean government could pay a lot of money for your vulnerabilities. <laughs> That ethical? Would you actually do that? Would you want to be responsible for that? So, 
it's really kind of which way you go is a very much a personal decision. Uh, to me, like the way I think about it is I believe uh, that you kind of have a responsibility and you're, to me, it's part of the ethical consideration of being a security researcher. Uh, you have to try responsible disclosure first and document, okay, I sent them an email to here, I called them here, I talked to this person here, right? Uh, but if they don't fix it, right, if they're dragging their feet, you, you're totally within your rights after 30, 60 days. As long as you've given the company a heads up that you're going to publicly release it, to me, I'm fine with that. Because, you know, you have a responsibility to the company, but you also have a responsibility to the users of that software, right? And if I'm an administrator, you know, you don't know where that software is being used, right? If I'm an administrator of some PHP application that I'm using in my company, and you found a very bad SQL injection vulnerability that allows people to steal credit cards, like my users are at risk. Like I want to know as soon as possible. So maybe I can put in a fix, or maybe I can you know, put in a patch or something like that. Yeah, yeah I had a very different question. Probably yes. comes from the Edward Shodan's picture that Khalil had on his uh, profile pic when he posted on Facebook. Sure. Well. So like, let's say if you somehow identify a vulnerability like Facebook is tracking your internet <coughs> usage time, or probably using your video device to get your video. And you cannot report this to the company because the company is actually gaining from this in unintended use of their own software's code. Uh -huh. And you were not given permission to actually find this out. So how would you report this to? Uh, Who would you report this to? How would you report this to? I mean, I mean, this is obviously a hack that you did or reverse engineer to find out in the code that they are doing something they are not supposed to do, but they are profiting from it. So they are never going to fix it at their end. I mean, then you have to make a personal decision. To me, I would probably do full disclosure if you wanted to maybe release it more anonymously, full disclosure. I think that would probably also be fine. I, or it would be your personal decision of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a tricky one. Uh, so the question I want to talk about really quickly before we stop here. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about um, Kevin Mitnick and all those other people. Would you hire a hacker? difficult question. Um, so the pro, right, is I want somebody who can find problems with what a bad guys do, and clearly this person is a legit hacker who has that security knowledge. What's the problem here? He might not report it to you, and he might sell it to somebody Exactly, else. right? And they've, they've also shown that they're skillful and motivated. So would you hire a, a convicted arsonist for the job of fire marshal? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, right? Because you don't trust them to do that job. Um, they also, I mean, this is kind of more job thing, right? But, you know, if the rest of your team members are all law-abiding citizens, right, and who haven't been in jail, and you're hiring this criminal into your organization, that could cause problems with the teamwork and morale in your organization. Um, you know, you have to assess their personality. They're hired all the time. Uh, important question I want to leave you with. How would you fire a hacker? <laughs> now, we saw that terrible Australian admin who got fired, who was not a crazy hacker who caused sewage damage, right? So how would you fire that hacker from your company? Who's to say they didn't leave anything at any places in your company or back door somewhere that you don't know about because they're better hackers than you? Uh, the other thing is, how do you even, um, 
you know, oftentimes actually offensive security skills don't necessarily translate to defensive skills. Right. Uh, there's a lot of overlap, but right. you know, still you can be great at one thing. You're great at breaking in, but well, now I have to defend it. Oh, there's a lot of like area to defend, and it's, right. it requires a little different mindset. Uh, great. Okay, I like this. We'll uh, wrap up with this on Monday, and then we'll get into some cool networking. Yeah, next time.